Say thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. I got to make a confession here this morning. I'm addicted. I have been for 35 years. I'm addicted to the cause of Christ. Amen. I'm you're addicted to the cause of Christ. Let's all stand to our feet. Praise the Lord. This addiction wakes me up in the morning, puts me to sleep at night. This addiction gives me energy, gives me hope, gives me a destiny, gives me a future. This addiction excites me, motivates me, compels me. This addiction moves me to sacrifice, to give, to bleed, and to die. This addiction will never leave me. It will always be with me. Because Christ says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But he's a part of us. And nothing could separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. How many love the Lord? How many are addicted to Jesus? Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you loved us. And you poured something inside of us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And because of that, we're no longer the same. We've come into a new lifestyle, a new addiction. And we thank you for that, God. It is dear to us. And we never want to be free from it. But we always want it to compel us for the future. Lord God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to minister to every heart and every life. Have your way as we receive your word. Your word that is transforming. Your word that is fixed. Your word that continuously moves us, oh God, to accomplish the mandate and our purpose in life. And your word has given us gifts and abilities and talents. Lord, let us use them to fulfill the mission of Christ. And we give you all the honor, the glory, the praise, and the worship. Have your way this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Give Jesus praise. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. It's good to see you all here in the house of the Lord and see you celebrating and rejoicing what God is able to do in hearts and lives. We celebrated about a month ago the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a great celebration it was. We're able to have some amazing services, amazing production that the church was packed from the front and the back, both services. It was amazing, the turnouts that came in. But see, for some people, they celebrated Resurrection Sunday in their own way. Now it's business as usual. Wait for maybe Christmas to come back to church or maybe a funeral or wedding or something else. They'll go back to church. Uh, But us, after the resurrection, we knew that Christ began to move in a greater capacity. And the way Christ moved in the greater capacity, he said, it's expedient for me to be with the Father. It's an urgent for me to be the Father because after that, I am sending down the promise of God to his body. And we are the body of Christ. Amen? Sending down the, the, the body or the spiritual body of Christ to be able to perform the things that God wants us to perform. And that's why the whole month of April we have consecrated it to learning about the spiritual gifts learning about the function of the spiritual gifts and how God uses people that everything that we need to be able to accomplish the task of God in our city is already here in the house because every single one of you have been given the supernatural, say supernatural, the supernatural gift and a supernatural ability to do what God has called the church to do. Now, one time Napoleon was looking at the map of the world and he was a conqueror. Tremendous general that armies and nations feared him. 
But as he looked and he scanned throughout the different zones that he wanted to overthrow and overcome, he looked at China and he said, that is a, a fearful sight. But the problem is, those people are sleeping giants and they don't realize the capacity that they have. If they would realize it, they would be unstoppable and even I could not stop them. You know that the devil says that same statement? When he looks around, even in this very place, and he sees people like you and I, but see, he sees people differently. He sees people that have the power and the anointing and the Spirit of God inside of them. And that makes principalities tremble. That makes the devil fearful. Not because of the mustaches you have or the tattoos you have. Not because of the physical attributes that you have. It is because of the anointing of God and the Spirit of God and the power of God that you have inside of you. But see, sometimes the church is not aware of that. Does that really understand our capacity? And you and I, in our own selves, we limit our capacities. But when God sees us, there is no limit to our capacities because it is not by our power nor by might. It is by the Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The Spirit of God is able to do these great and mighty things. If you and I would get hold of that, then we know that we're going to be able to do all the things that God has called us to do and nothing could stop the army of God. Has not yet and never will. As long as you understand where we are and what we are called to do. See, when we know that, we understand that, then God is going to do great and mighty things. You know, there's a Gallup survey that was done, and it was very shocking to many people. They said in this nation, only 10% of Christians are actively involved in the work of the ministry. 10% only. It's not talking about people that are not Christians. It's talking about those that proclaim Christianity. And you know what's other, another sad statistic that the Gallup poll took? Only 50% of Christians are willing to do something for the Lord. The other 50% say, I don't want to do anything. I just want to come to church, receive Pay my tithe like a little club and then walk out and do nothing else. Don't ask me to do anything for the church because I'm a busy person. I'm raising a family. I have a job and my kids are involved in different things and they're involved in sports and I have to be a family man now and I have to do this and I have to do that and, and they do all these things they have to do and I don't have time for ministry. 50% of the church says that. The sleeping giant. But how sad it is. If everybody else had that attitude, you and I would not be here. Because there was another 50% that say, here I am, Lord. I'm addicted to the cause of Christ. I'm willing to do whatever you call me to do. And our founder is a prime example of that. You know, our founder raised his children. He's got them involved in sporting activities and colleges and all these extra uh, activities that they're involved in. He, he got involved with them, but yet he still had the time in ministry to take the world for Jesus Christ. So do we have the time to do that? Sure, we have the time to do that. You have the time to raise your marriage. You have a time to have a family. You have a time to do a career. You have a time to get involved in your kids' life. But also, God has provided the time of ministry that God wants to use you to impact lives, to change lives, and to touch hearts. If it's in your heart, then God will do it. See, whatever's in our heart is what we give ourselves to. See, when you're addicted to something, you're going to make time for it. When you have it inside your heart, you are going to make time for it. And it's, going to be, it's something that's burning inside of you. You're going to make time for that. 
See in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 through 8. The Bible says right here, For by grace given to me, for by the grace given to me, I tell everybody among you not to think of themselves more highly than he should. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function. The same way we are many, we who are many, are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, let us use it according to the standard of our faith. Of faith. If it is service, in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhortation, in exhortation. Giving with generosity. Leading with diligence. Showing mercy with cheerfulness. Right here is talking about the various gifts and the abilities that God has given to us. Now when you think about those statistics that I spoke about. Are those the intentions of Christ? See, Jesus Christ, when he went to be with the Father, he had a greater expectation towards the church. He said, you know, that that once I go to be with my Father, there's going to be a greater expectation. Great things are going to take place. Why? Because God is going to empower his body for service or for ministry. The title of my message is Ministry Lifestyle. Say Ministry Lifestyle. Ministry lifestyle is something that is a part of us. Just the way we used to have a different lifestyle. If you used to have the lifestyle of an alcoholic, you would get up in the morning, the first thing you want to do is get well. Or make sure you don't get sick. So early in the morning, you start chug-a-lugging, right? And you're drinking and you have whatever consists of the lifestyle, that's what you were. If it was, if you were addicted to some kind of drug that your lifestyle is right away, you're going to get up in the morning, you're going to hustle for your drug. Because that's your lifestyle. If you have a lifestyle of uh, being an athlete, or someone that's conditioned themselves to be a professional athlete, then in that lifestyle, it takes a great commitment, and you get up early in the morning, and you start running, or you begin to do whatever it takes, that you can be a top performance in physical, uh, physical performance. Because that's your lifestyle of an athlete. Those are the lifestyles and people indulge themselves in those things. In the same way, when you live the lifestyle of a Christian, and God has given you a call to ministry, then you come and you wake up in the morning to say, Lord, how can I be the minister that you want me to be? Well, some of you right now are saying, well, Pastor, you're kind of segregating people here that, you know, you're a licensed minister, and Pastor Israel, and Pastor Gabriel, and, you know, and, and all these different ministers, you know, that, that's and Pastor Manuel, and, and, and they're ministers, but, you know, how about the rest of us? Well, you know, the rest of us, all of us, are called into ministry. We're all called into ministry. Ministry is not just for a few. Ministry is for everybody. Say Everybody. Everybody is called to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, how do you say that? And how can I make that declaration? Well, first of all, I want you to know and understand what the definition of ministry is. Or to be a minister. See, to be involved in ministry simply means service. Say service. It is service. And who is called to serve? We all have been called to serve in one capacity or the other. All of us are called to service. And you don't have have to have a credential to be a minister. Because every single one of us have been called to serve someone or something. We've been called to service. Now the church, when you begin to look at the church in a way that is called to as a person, place, or thing, a noun, you say, well, this is a church. And it's a place. And it's a noun. But see right here what the Apostle Paul was telling the church. 
I want you to be a church that understands the very definition of ministry. And it's called a verb. A verb is action. See, a noun is like a president, a soldier, a person, a place, an amusement park, a car, a speaker, a thing. But a verb is an action. It is to cry, to laugh, to shout, to be aggressive. It is to punch, to kick, and to do something is an action. And the church has been called to be a verb. It is called to be action. It is called to move forward and make declarations. It is called to go beyond the four corners of these concrete walls and act upon the call of God and the mandate of God and the cause of God. That's what a church is all about. And that's the definition. When you have ministry lifestyle, then you do it every opportunity that you have. You make yourself available to minister in every way that you can. And we're going to break down in the various ways that you and I could minister in how God called ministry. First of all, let us look at the direction of ministry. The direction of ministry is Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in, name, in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God, your Father, through Him. Whatever you do in word or deed, in the direction of why we do ministry. We do ministry unto the Lord, don't we? See, Matthew 25 also makes that statement. It says, when I feed the hungry, when I give water to the thirsty... When I clothe the naked, when I visit the prisoner, when I encourage the discouraged, and whatever I do, I do it unto the Lord. So first of all, if we're going to do something for Jesus, if we're going to do the ministry of Jesus Christ, we must realize that the first thing in our direction of service should always be, I'm doing this unto the Lord. I'm doing it for the Lord. And when you do that, then you have the right attitude of ministry. When you do not have that right attitude, when you're doing it for man, then you're going to be greatly discouraged. Because sometimes man might not give you the recognition that you need. See, when you're doing it for yourself, then you might feel good about yourself, but when things happen and things get in the way, you're going to want to give up on ministry and not do anything else. But see, when you're doing it unto the Lord, when you're doing ministry unto God, then you always have the right attitude towards ministry. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't have the right attitude. And because of that, they stop ministry because they get hurt. Have you ever heard that before? Why, I used to be involved in ministry. I used to do things for God. And I used to, you know, put effort and time. And, and it seemed like they never appreciated anything that I did. Have you ever heard people like that? And they try to discourage. They try to influence people. Not, how I many you know influence is great? Influence is big. See, someone could influence you to achieving your purpose in God. Or someone could influence you and discourage you from doing the work of the ministry. There's, I've heard some people say, you know what, you're going to get involved in ministry and, and you're all excited, but you've got to be careful because, you know what, sometimes the pastor's not going to recognize you. As a matter of fact, I don't think the pastor's going to appreciate you. He never appreciated me. That's why I don't do anything anymore. How many of you know that right off, the, right off the bat, you're doing it for the wrong reasons? You're, re you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. We do ministry. Not to be able to gloat in ourselves or our abilities. Not to satisfy men or women. Not to get the accolades and have our names on the screens or our picture on our walls. We don't do it for any of those reasons. 
We do it because Jesus Christ did it for me. He came not to be served, but He came to serve. And because of that, I want to serve because Jesus served. And I come here to serve Him. And as long as you keep that, no matter what happens around you, you're going to have your hurts. You're going to have your disillusions. You're going to have your failures. You're going to have your short fallings. You're going to try things. It may not work out just right. But as long as you say, Lord, I'm doing it unto you anyways. I'm doing it, God, because you loved me while I was yet a sinner. You served me when I needed mercy and grace. Then you're going to keep on keeping on. Because your direction of ministry is in the right place. You're doing it for all the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. Second of all, when I do ministry unto the Lord, I do it unto my brethren. Amen? See, I do ministry to the believers. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, it says, For God is not unjust so that as to overlook your work and that he loved you. And has shown his name to you and his service to the saints as you do so. In other words, he's telling you right here, you know what? God is a God that recognizes when we are doing a service unto each other. See, the service that we do, we do to the saints. How many of you love your brothers and sisters in the church? Don't we love our brothers and sisters in the church? I mean, my wife and I were gone and, you know, and we were missing you. And we couldn't wait to come back and serve you. Couldn't wait to come back and, and be a part of your lives. To pray for you. To encourage you. To call you. We couldn't wait to do that. I do ministry because I love to do ministry. I don't do ministry as a mere career or a job. It goes beyond that. Because I've done ministry for 35 years. Even before I even got a penny. I did it because I do it unto the Lord. That is something that I always want to do. I just want to do ministry because I love ministry. Why do I love ministry? Because I love people. And I love the church and I love my brothers and sisters. That even though sometimes we could be unlovable, can't we? We could be unlovable sometimes. But yet in spite of all that, we do it because we love one another. That we do the ministry, the work of, of God, because we love one another. And third of all, in the, our direction of ministry, we do it towards the lost. We do it towards the unbelievers. The Bible says that we need to be the, the salt of the earth. We need to be a light unto the world. A world that is dark and in sin. And God has called us to do that. That we take our ministry and our blessings. The peace that you and I have received. The encouragement that you and I have received. The forgiveness that we have received. All the things that brought us to where we are right now that we receive. We go back and we take it into a hurting world. Into a hurting society. That we as a church. That yes, we do ministry unto the Lord. We do ministry unto each other. But we do not keep it here. But we as a church have been called through the Great Commission. To go into the highways and byways. To disciple men and women throughout the nations of the world. And that is glorious that you and I have the privilege of doing that. Don't you love to minister to an unbeliever, amen? Don't you love to see people that at one time were hurting and in bondage, but yet the power of God brings them to repentance and brings them to the joy of salvation. And you see their lives being transformed at one time. They were on their way to destruction, but now they're living a life of joy and peace and their families are reunited and their children are serving God and they're here in church and they're not in prison. They're not addicted in some corner, but they're here lifting up their hands to the heavens, giving praise and honor to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Don't you love to do what God has called us to do in the lives of unbelievers? Thank you, Gabriel, for your service to the sinners. Amen? Gabriel loves to do that. You know, Gabriel loves to minister. He'll minister to the body. But Gabriel will go to a street rally and sing a song of redemption to the sinner. Amen? Those are the things that make us unique as a movement, Victory Outreach. Those are things that give us our identity of who we are. 
You know, I've been talking to our church. I'm going to be going shortly to rushing over to Mesa and preaching to our awesome church in Mesa. And you know, and they've been calling me and they say, Pastor, Pastor, we, we got a sound system. And they were so excited about a sound system. And what they want to do with a sound system, to take it in every dark alley. To take it where all the sin is, where all the sinners are. Say, Pastor, we need more flyers. We got rid of 10,000 already, and that's just a little bit. But get us more flyers, Pastor, because we, we're anxious. We're ready to serve our city. Our church in Mesa and Shadow, and they have such a burning desire to reach Mesa for the Lord. They have such a desire that they're out there, hitting in the streets day after day. They're gathering together and reaching people for Jesus Christ. Because they know one thing, that something powerful is going to happen in the East Valley. They know that there's so much lostness there in the East Valley. That they know that God has called them to go and minister to those hurting people. And they have a burden inside of them. And they can't wait to hook up that sound system. Begin to blast and tell people about the love of Jesus Christ. There's an excitement in a church. When we are a soul winning church. When we understand ministry. Is reaching the lost for his honor, for his glory. Number four, four, or number three, what are the four areas of ministry that we do? See, as people, we minister in these four needs, in human needs. These are human needs that we have. First of all, we minister to the needs, the physical needs of people. And we know that Matthew 25, 31 through 40 speaks about that. And I quoted it a little bit earlier in my message. To feed the hungry, to give them water, to take care of their needs. And that's something that Eddie Ortiz loves to do. He goes and he has a street rally somewhere in a park. And he invites the community. And then they go, he has these guys that love to grill up some food. And they grill up hot dogs and they have food and they set it all up. And the community comes out and we give them food to eat. And then he gives them gifts. And then they have all these gifts for their children. And their children are there and they're receiving these gifts and these toys that perhaps they could never afford it. They wouldn't have, but here we are, Victory Outreach, showing and meeting physical needs. Taking care of those needs. And as a church, we minister to their physical needs. When men and women come into our homes, they come into our homes and they have physical needs. They've been out there and they have needs. They don't have too much. Sometimes they only have the clothing on their back. And then they have the bless me room. How many of you guys love the bless me room? Amen. They have the bless me room. And there they go in the bless me room. And they get their clothing and they get blessed. I was telling them the first service, some of them don't mismatch. They mismatch a little bit. But it's all right. You're still looking sharp, guys. Amen. You're looking sharp. <laughs> Meeting needs. The women are blessed. Amen, women of God. We have the women's homes growing. There are more women coming in. And there they are, elegant women of God. That God is changing their lives. And their physical needs are being taken care of. And they're being clothed and fed and nurtured and Christ and loved. So we see that we minister and take care of those needs. And number two, another need that we have is the need for emotional healing, emotional ministry. And we see that in the scriptures say that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. So also we minister to the emotional needs of people. It is something that's a need inside of us because when we were out in the world, how many know that the, the devil messed us all up? Messed up our emotions. And all emotions, all we had inside of us was anger and hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness. Our emotions, we were there and all we had was going through depression and going through all these things in our emotional being. But yet someone came to us and see our condition. They see how we found ourselves in sorrow and pain. How many of you see people like that sometimes? 
where you see people that you know that emotionally they're a wreck. You see the sorrow in their face. And as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we go and tell them, I have good news for you. Lift up your head. Lift up your head because God has something for you. Jesus loves you. And love is able to heal a multitude. And love is able to heal a hurting heart and a broken heart. To mend the emotional wounds of, of abuse. The, to mend the emotional uh, uh, things that we've gone through and suffered. And we find ourselves in emotional wreck, but then God has called the church of God to bring emotional healing. That you could see someone feeling down and encourage them and give them that word that is going to lift them up. Give them that word that is going to give them hope. Because at one time they were walking in hopelessness. But how many you know that the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ is able to give hope to the hopeless? Oh, how many you remember when someone lifted you up emotionally? When someone gave you love that you needed so bad in your heart? When someone encouraged you when you were so discouraged? When someone gave you a promise of God that it is for you and your family. When someone was able to give you those words that lifted you up out of that pit and out of that condition. To be able to replace those negative emotions with positive emotions. That now you could trust, you could feel, you could love, you could forgive and embrace. All those things that God is able to do when someone went and ministered to your emotional needs. That's what the ministry is all about. Number three, God is able to minister to our intellectual needs. And what does that mean? It means that man is hungry to learn and to grow. And if the church of God is not going to provide it, the Bible says that in the last days, there's going to be a lot of false teachings that are going to go on. But because people are hungry for that. People are hungry for learning. And sometimes if we don't provide that for them, they're going to hear all these other things that are going to impress them. See, some people only are intellectuals to impress other people. Not there to lift people up or tell truth, but to impress others to how smart they are, how bright they are. But see, if we are going to give intellectual ministry to someone or feed someone the word of God. We do it so they could be grounded in the truth. And when we're grounded in the truth, then we know the word of God. And the word of God is rich inside of us. And how many thank God for the Veti that we have in Victory Outreach? That Victory Outreach, we have our Veti course that we can learn and grow. That when people, Christians, should be hungry for the word, right? That should be a part of I'm hungry for the word. And when people are hungry, then we need to provide that ministry to them. To say, here's the word of God. We have these courses that you can learn about Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, apologetics, how to defend the faith. We can learn eschatology. We can learn all these great things. We can learn hermeneutics and we can learn homiletics. And we can learn all these things. But we're stimulated by the word of God and we're eating the word of God. And it's enriching our soul and it's making us stronger. And we're hungry for that. Thank God we're a ministry that believes in feeding them the word of God and training us in the word of God. Those things are vital and important. We provide it Sunday nights when we have our break-off sessions. Not only do we speak about the giftings, but also we're able to teach them what they're all about. Because some, there's some people out there that have other teachings that they say that the gifts are only for the apostolic age. Or the gifts were only for the, the apostles. But once they have the written word, they didn't need the gifts anymore. There's nowhere in the Bible... That the Bible says that the gifts are going to cease. No, the gifts are always going to be alive. Because the same way we always need every part of the body, we always need the gifts to be in operation. Amen? And why are they there? They're there to build up the church. They're there to encourage you in those four basic needs. And last need we have is spirituality. To meet the spiritual needs of people. That we would continue to grow spiritually. That we would be a church and a people. 
that always wants to meet spiritual needs. Always know and realize how important that God's church will be ministered to in their spiritual needs. That's why we have our prayer. And we are prayer ministries. That way we have these other ministries that are able to take care of our spiritual needs. Because we have a city, we have a people that are dead in their sins. And they need to be brought this gospel of Jesus Christ that is able to give them that born again experience. And that born again of spirits is to waken you up in the spirit. And to know all the great plans that God has for you and I. And those are the things. And that's what ministry is all about. And that's why a lot of times the devil fears what the church of God is able to do. The capacity of this church is amazing. Say amazing. The ability of this church is amazing. Why is that? Because you as a church, when you grab hold of that, to say, Lord, here I am. I want to minister to someone else. In whichever capacity. How many of you know that when someone walks into the front door of that church, if you shake their hand, you're ministering to them? You know when someone walks into that church and they might feel down and hurt inside and they feel so many different emotions, your smile could minister to them? You don't have to say too much. All you have to do is smile and shake their hand and embrace them and welcome to the church of God. Every time you have that opportunity that you can minister to someone, give them that word of encouragement and to lift them up. And when the body of Christ is doing that, then you have a healthy church that people cannot wait to come to church because there is a church here in the West Valley that cares about ministry. There is a church in the West Valley that cares about you and cares about your life and cares about your future. There are men and women of God that no longer are living for themselves but are living for others. That do not have the mentality, I don't have time for ministry like that 90% or that other 50% that don't even want anything to do with ministry. But there is a group of people saying, Lord, here I am. Make me, use me, whichever way you want to use me. You've called me to help someone else the way they help me. You've called me to encourage someone else the way I've been encouraged. You've called me to lift someone else up the way I was lifted up. And when you and I do that, then we know that we're going to do what God has called us to do. How many are ready to see a great revival take place? Ready to see healing take place? Ready to see the work of the ministry explode beyond our imagination? And the way it's going to happen is when you and I wake up in the Spirit. Wake up and be encouraged. And put all those things aside and say, here I am, God. I'm available. Use me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're ready to do that, I want you to stand to your feet. God wants us to get rid of all the excuses. Because I'm you, there's no excuses. There are no excuses. We all have the capacity to minister to someone else in many different capacities and many different ways. Because if you have Jesus inside of you, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, then you have a capacity to do the supernatural. You have the ability to do the supernatural. Not by your own power, your own might, or your own goodness. Because we all fall short. But it's through the grace and the mercy of God that he wants to use your life to minister to someone else. When we become that unselfish people, like many of the people in the world, or maybe some people in church are, and become, say, Lord, here I am, Jesus, use my life. Then we are going to see... Miracles take place the way they happen in the book of Acts. See, Jesus told the church in the book of Acts, you are going to expand your capacity because I go to be with the Father, but I'll send down the promise of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit will enable you and I to do what we cannot do in the natural, but he will flow through the supernatural. 
How many believe in the supernatural move of God? The supernatural move of God is still here today. It's still in operation. Still wants to move. Still wants to move. And committed people. Submitted people. Surrendered people. To say, Lord, use me as a minister of this glorious gospel. As God has spoken to your heart, minister to your life. And they begin to sing a song. I want you to make your way to these altars. And say, here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am, God. Use my life. I pray for this congregation I pray that men and women would pick up the mantle of a minister to bring healing, strength and deliverance and salvation to the lost Lord let us commit ourselves and Lord we believe when we do that we will see our land healed, our families restored, our children saved, our marriages strong Will we do the work of the ministry? And Lord, we know that the work of the ministry is not just for a few. It's for all. Jesus, you have called all of us. All of us to be ministers. In whichever capacity, God, you have gifted us with. The talents yet you have given us. The ability, supernaturally and naturally, you have given us. Jesus, we give it to you to minister to this world. We give it to you. We give it to you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can use. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. If you can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Take my hands. Take my hands, Lord. And my feet. Touch my heart. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak.
this, Lord God. Jesus, could you imagine, church, what would happen when every person takes up the mantle of a minister, male, brothers and sisters, whoever you might be, when we all do that, could you imagine the impact that you and I would make, all of us would make in our cities, in our world? See, the the apostles were very serious about ministry. They were very serious. No matter what, whatever capacity. That's why they were able to take thousands for the Lord Jesus Christ. How many are believing for thousands to get saved here in our city? And thousands to come to Christ. And thousands to be ministered to. It's possible. What makes it possible? Number one, the power of God's Holy Spirit. Number two, you as a vessel that God wants to use. Could you imagine the impact you can make? I look at all you, I go, man, what a tremendous impact ability that we all have to do the work of the ministry. Next week, I'm going to continue. This is a two-part message. As far as how God uses and why God wants us to be involved, number one, I'll give you a little tease here, all right? How many ready for a tease? It says, first, we are created for ministry. Second, we are uh, saved for ministry. Third, we're called to ministry. Fourth, we have been gifted for ministry. And it goes on and on. We should break it down. How many are looking forward to that? We're created for this. We are made for it. How many know we're made for it? You are made for ministry. You are created for greatness. You were saved for ministry. That's why He saved you. He saved you. And we're still looking forward to the great things that God is going to do. How many are ready for tonight? You ready for tonight? We are going to have church tonight. Bring someone. Minister to someone. Bring them to church and see what God is going to do. Give the Lord praise. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ready? Also, how many you were blessed? You could keep on yeah. Yeah, a little bit, a little soft right there. All right. Okay, okay, pick it up a little bit. There you go. Yeah, there you go. All right, there we go. But we appreciate Sister Kabi, right? We appreciate her ministry. Kabi, is this your first CD? Her very first CD. Tremendous CD. Pick it up. It's in the cafe area. Make sure you get one. Be blessed and bless someone else with it. Make sure you get one. God bless you as we dismiss with a song. Bless.